Hey everybody, Kyle Sasser here, and it's everybody's favorite time of the month, market statistics time. These statistics are for the Dayton metro area for August 2023. Now to explain these statistics, we do have to kind of go over what specifically we are looking at. So we are comparing July numbers, because that is the most recent month that is closed, and we are comparing July 2023 to July 2022. And the reason we do that is because the natural year, those 12 months, there is a natural ebb and flow of homes being sold. So we look at year to year because that is a more dependable indicator compared to month to month. Since the market is kind of in a wild state currently, I do go into the month to month more because it is kind of important to know where we're at and how we're shaping up compared to previous months. But you do have to kind of keep in the back of your mind that there is a natural shift just over that course of the year. And the obvious two things are wintertime things generally slow down. Beginning and end of school year are also typically slow periods. So we're comparing July 2023 to July 2022. If you've been watching previous statistics video, kind of know the general consensus of what's going on which is basically prices are back up after the late 2022 market die down, <laughs> just to uh, not put too positive a spin on it. But basically end of 2022, last six months, basically not much happened at all so far as real estate goes. March 2023, buyers all came back and home prices have been rising. But there's been a little bit of a conflict because interest you would think with interest rates so high, they're six and a half to seven and a half percent. It's kind of where they've been bouncing around. So with interest rates so high, listings actually growing, the number of active inventory actually expanding a little bit, you would think that prices would decline, but that has not been the case. So we've kind of been having those conflicting market indicators. Now, if you would like your own copy of these market statistics report to follow along with, there should be a link in the description down below. Go to the website. We have a PDF version and we also have brand new just this month. We also have just a web page version that you're able to access that has all of these charts and numbers and things of that nature. I try to provide as much information as possible to my clients. And this is a great way to understand what is going on in the market. Now, you might remember back to math class uh, whenever we're talking about median and averages. So average is you would take the number of homes. Let's say you have 10 homes. You take the price that those 10 homes sold for, you add them up, you divide it by 10. That gives you the average sales price. Median home price is a little different. So what median is, is that is the point in the market where there is an equal number of homes for sale for more money and for less money. So it's more of the midpoint of the market versus the average. Typically, I, I look more towards the median sales price to see what has been happening because average sales price can be affected if there's a large number of very inexpensive or very expensive homes that sell. So for instance, if a handful of 10 to $15 million houses sell, that will have a major effect on the average sales price. Well, let's dive into these statistics. If you download these, there's a pretty good page here. This is a recent market shift. So this basically covers the last three, four, five years. It kind of tells you what the different turning points of the market was. But so far as uh, statistics go, a little deception going on with some of these numbers. So I will go into the month to month just to kind of understand what has happened. Total number of closed sales is down 26% from 1,597 to 1,182. Median sales price though is up 8.1% from 221,850 to 239,900. Now that's one of the ones that's a little deceptive because most people when they hear, you know, hey, medium home price is up, 8.1% compared to last year, they think that that is a linear, linear line. <laughs> it is not in this case. So July 2022, we were at 221,000. We dropped to a low in January of $189,950. And we have since climbed all the way back up to 239,900. Average sales price is up 7.0% from uh, 248,422 dollars to 265,797 dollars. Total dollar volume, which I don't really pay too much attention to, is down 20% to 314. Medium percent of original sales price has held at 
100%. And again, this one is one of those deceptive ones because we actually dropped to 96.7% in January, which was a decrease of 2.4% compared to the previous year. Median time to sale has held at 41 days relatively uh, from 44 days in the previous year. Total number of new listings is down 15% from 1,909 new listings to 1,622. And total number of active listings is down from 1,594 to 1,236. The doom and gloom section here, which is uh, foreclosures, bank-owned properties, and short sales, not too much going on here to affect <laughs> the overall sales price. Foreclosures are up 120% from 5 to 11, and short sales are down, actually, 80% from 5 to 1. Now, I do like to dive into the different price points because uh, the truth is, is a million-dollar house is going to sell for a little bit different time frame than a $200,000 house. The primary reason why is because of buyer pool. So the number of buyers of million dollar homes is a lot less than the number of buyers of $200,000 homes. But basically, number of new listings is down across the board. So 50 to 100,000 was down 35% to 119. 100,000 to 150,000 was down 15.4% to 230. 150,000 to 200,000, number of new listings was down 28.8%, total of 279. 200,000 to 250 was down 10.4% to 215. 250,000 to 300,000 was down 12%, 212. 400 to 600,000 was actually up 15.1% to 206. 600 to a million was down 6.5% to 58 total homes. And total number of closed sales by sales price was also down, basically across the board except for the two highest price points. So 100 to 150,000 was down 31% to 136. 150 to 200,000 total number of sales was down 31.6% to 216. 200 to 250,000 was down 30.3% to 166. 250 to 300,000 was down 14.6% to 175. 300,000 to 400,000 was down 23.7% to 200. 400 to 600,000 is down 14.6% to 135. 600 here, that's where we make the switch. So 600 to a million was up 22.2% to 44, and a million or more held at four. So those are the Dayton real estate market statistics. So what overall is going on in the market? Do we have a crash that's coming up soon? When should you wait to buy a house? Those are the market, <laughs> those are the questions that I get all the time. I've actually pulled statistics all the way back to uh, like 2009. What I have found is a little surprising. So demand does not really change that much. Things are relatively steady and have been for some time. What has really changed is supply. And there's a two part thing. So when I pull the real estate market statistics going back that far, you can see the active inventory was almost up to uh, 9,000 units. It was around 9,000 or 10,000 at the tail end of the Great Recession there. We have steadily sold through that to get to our current level of, you know, we hang around like 1,200, 1,300, 1,400 homes for sale. And when you have that few homes, you know, any slight change in demand is going to have a much larger impact on sales price and availability than if we had you know, 5,000, 6,000 homes for sale. So that's interesting and obviously lots of people have been talking about. The secondary piece of this is if you look at total number of home starts, you can really only find this data nationwide easily. But if you look at the total number of home starts, you will see after the Great Recession, basically builders got wrecked. Number of new home starts just absolutely plummeted. And since then, we haven't actually recovered on the number of new home starts yet. Um, you know, we'll put the chart up here so you can see it. My rough estimation is that we're at like, you know, late 1990s levels of construction. It's not good. That's definitely a significant issue when it comes to where we're at so far as our supply problems go. So basically, if we had a lot more homes available for sale, this amount of demand would not be affecting that home price as much as it is. Because here's the thing, if it was a demand problem, I would think that our current setup would be doing it, you know. Interest rates are six and a half to seven and a half percent. 
consumer confidence is relatively low because we have had such high inflation. Technically people, now real estate is a bit of an exception on inflation because if there's gonna be three or four years of inflation, it's actually better to buy the house and take a loan because you will have more future dollars to pay the current uh, sales price. So you actually technically save a little bit of money when it's high inflation, but that it's, it's, inflation is terrible. Uh, I definitely am not hoping for continued high, high inflation at all. To me, the main thing is we need to solve this supply problem. Now, you know, there's only so many homes currently built and you know, the trend is for people to generally stay put in that house for years. <laughs> so basically we need to build more units. The problem is twofold. One, People really don't like suburban sprawl as much as they used to. There's a, starting to be a lot of pushback on this sort of stuff in planning. And for good reason, you know, like converting just square mileage of farmland into houses, like you are never getting that farmland back. It's overall, it's not a great way to plan for effective population growth. So that basically just leaves multifamily, either, you know, duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes, or even larger condo towers apartment complexes, things of that nature. And again, the pushback is people in single family neighborhoods typically do not want multifamily in their neck of the woods. They just, they feel that it is a net negative on the neighborhood for whatever reason. Typically speaking, you don't see a lot of those proje projects, especially when there are much easier things around to do, like buy a farm and put houses on it, <laughs> which is the current development plan. But when we're talking on the scale of what we need to have an impact on this overall supply shortage, like we don't need to be talking about neighborhoods, we need to be talking about like complexes. That's me on my soapbox basically pointing out what I see as the major problem. I don't have the clout at all to have a major impact politically or even socially at this point to, you know, be able to sway that. You can help by subscribing to this video. <laughs> but to me, that is the fix for the problem. So minus that or minus something that just absolutely crushes demands, like major economic, just absolute disaster that would probably put the Great Recession to shame. So barring something like that that would kill demand, we have to solve the supply problem to get home prices, uh, not even necessarily just to drop home prices, just to be able to comfortably maintain prices where they are. We have to solve this supply problem. So I don't see anything in these market statistics I don't see anything in these market statistics that indicate that there is any sort of slowdown or you know home crash or drop or anything anything like that happened. We did actually have a market drop retraction last year, that six months, and that was a prime time to buy a house. You know, I was able to negotiate huge price reductions and also get a massive amount of repairs done just because nobody was buying houses then. Basically, buyers have kind of figured that this is the the new normal and buyers are back in the market now, and that's why home prices are going up. And that's also in line with what a typical home price retraction looks like. Retractions are usually not, like after the Great Recession, they're usually not a multi-year slide that cuts home prices by 40%. Most retractions are six months to a year, and price reduction is about 10%, you know, 10, 12, 15%. That's the normal ebb and flow of the real estate market. Anything longer than a year is actually a bit exceptional. If you look at the historic data, you will only see a few of those blips over the last 40 years, and the primary one being the Great Recession. But barring that, we haven't really had a lot of multi-year slides with significant housing value drops. And my mantra is definitely never say never. And basically I monitor these stats every month so I can detect any sort of changes in the market. It's definitely not as strong or as crazy as it was in 2021 and 2022. The demand and the craziness and like the hype is not there to bring it to that level. Currently I would say the market is basically maintaining with a slight upward pressure just solely due to the number of new listings coming on is not enough to really outweigh what the demand is doing. So if you're hoping for a market downturn in the next six months, I see absolutely no indication of it. And the long-term big picture stuff, you know, supply and demand, supply is extraordinarily low. And so it would take demand dropping significantly to have a major shift in price. So not a lot of good news there. So, and this is not just true in Hillsborough and Pinellas County. This, uh, the, these general trends basically show up across the country. And primarily there is low inventory everywhere. 
Now, if you look at a snapshot of number of new home starts, that is basically down everywhere. <laughs> so if you look at the chart, you will see the Great Recession, and then you will see a, basically in the Great Recession, builders got wrecked. They had the inventory they couldn't sell, and the number of new home starts plummeted. We'll put a chart up here so you can just kind of follow along. So absolutely plummeted, and then it has only been a very slow climb back out since. And my rough estimate just looking at this is we are maybe back to 1990s numbers on the number of uh, new home starts. You know, meanwhile, there's a lot more people in the country than there used to be, <laughs> you know, back in 2006. The rough numbers that I saw from the census was about 30 million people. And this is across the entire country. So the question I always get asked is what, when is the market going to drop? The answer is we've already had a drop. We had a retraction. We had six months of last year where I was begging people to go look at houses. It was a phenomenal time to buy a house. I was negotiating $30,000 price reductions and getting a ton of repairs on top of that. That shows up in that median sales price or percentage of uh, original list price uh, received number. You can see that it dropped from 100% down to 95%. So that was a phenomenal time to buy. But as you can see, when, when we just don't have the supply, any sort of demand coming back leads to rising home prices because there's just there's not enough buffer there to keep things stable. So what's the fix for that? A lot of people think that you know demand was going to get crushed, which it did for six months. <laughs> I can tell you the number of buyers are back. They are definitely different buyers than they were before. Current buyers are definitely not looking to pull out all the stops, making like crazy, crazy high offers for moderate demand housing. But there are buyers and that is moving the price. You would think that with interest rates being, you know, six and a half to seven and a half percent, that would do it. You would think that inflation would do it, even though inflation is more of a consumer mindset affectation on real estate than a numbers perspective. When we're talking about inflation in real estate, if you can get a loan today on a property, but you know that you're going to have high inflation for the next two, three, four years, you're actually saving money because you can pay for the mortgage using tomorrow's dollars, which you will have a lot more of due to inflation. One the actual slight benefit of inflation <laughs> is that it makes long-term loans effectively cheaper for uh, the person paying the mortgage. Also, Florida, huge increases in property taxes, just with where the prices are now, and also homeowners insurance has doubled or tripled in a lot of cases, and people see these things and they are still buying houses. The only thing we can surmise from this is these things are not going to kill demand and barring some major economic catastrophe that brings its own alternate set of problems. Usually you can't get a loan is the main, main one so far as housing is concerned. All of the factors are around that should be keeping demand down and prices stable or even slight decline. And that is not happening in the real estate market. And the reason why is because the supply is so short. So the fix, and to use a metaphor, think of it like the hot toy at Christmas. I'm old, so I'm not going to use <laughs> the examples that I always hear. Cabbage Patch dolls. I also remember Tickle Me Elmo's Furbies. Past that, though, I don't remember. Uh, leave me a comment below for your favorite toy fad. <laughs> But so the fix, so if you if you have like the new hot toy comes out, oh, PlayStation 5, that's probably the best recent example. So very short supply, gets released at Christmas. They sell out at the stores. There's not really any available. So prices tend to go higher because you have to be willing to pay a premium to buy a PlayStation 5. The fix for that is not making PlayStation 5s more expensive. The fix is pumping out more PlayStation 5s. The supply is what solves that problem. So with housing, we need to fix the supply problem to stabilize prices and, you know, kind of eliminate this this whipsaw, you know, effect that's going on. The downside with that is one, real estate takes a very long time to build. Tract builders, which can usually build it quickly, they're usually 6 to 9 months and, you know, we also have some some labor issues and stuff going on. So how single houses take a long time to construct and multifamily, whether we're talking about threeplexes and fourplexes or even large scale condo and apartment complexes, which do help to solve this supply problem. One, those also take a long time to build, um, sometimes years. 
In the case of uh, you know large scale condos and apartments, that can be a five year process. We have a very long lead time to get those built. And the secondary problem is most people don't want those in their neighborhood. Just homeowners of single family homes typically do not want multifamily built next to them. Whether it's right or not, that is the overall impression. And that's probably what this solution is probably gonna to have to be because we would have to build so many single family homes. And there's a lot of irritation and pushback on the suburban sprawl development. Just people don't really want to turn you know, the current existing green spaces into plan developments and single family homes. And honestly, the time lead on that would be so long to effectively build that many houses that it's not, I don't, personally, I don't think it's a feasible plan. So if we're looking at like, when's the market gonna crash? Barring some e major economic catastrophe, supply is so tight with so few home starts that we are probably gonna be like this for a while. <laughs> like, like years, I would, I would think. After, like after having looked at these numbers, it just, it feels like it's going to be this way for a very long time. So far as like staying on the fence or waiting three, four, five months, maybe there will be a crash there at th that point in time. I'm seeing absolutely nothing in these real estate statistics that would indicate that. There's definitely some areas that are lower demand than others. Also, I will say that compared to the peak of 2022, it's a lot easier to buy a house now. It's not the crazy free-for-all. Houses are not receiving 20 or 40 offers. If there's multiple offers, it's usually, you know, two or three or four. In rare cases, we'll be up around like seven, eight, nine, ten. But there's been plenty of other cases where they just don't have other offers. The market's a lot different than it was in 2021-2022. It's more relaxed, but you do have to expect to have some difficulty finding a place. The price is probably not going to be too appealing to you. There's nothing really in the statistics here that shows that there's going to be a downturn anytime soon. Basically what we have done is prices have come up and now it looks like they're holding or in the case of Pinellas County actually accelerating. So I'd like to thank you for tuning in to these Dayton Metro market statistics. These stats cover basically surrounding like eight or nine counties. Um, I think it's up to now. Uh, so Springfield, Piqua, Lebanon, Springboro, Springfield, all that stuff is you know, obviously Dayton, Oakwood, Kettering, Beaver Creek, all of that stuff is in this video um, included in these numbers. If you are interested in maybe what's going on in your particular neck of the woods, there's a contact me link down below. Feel free to schedule a call there. If you're interested in buying or selling a home in the greater Dayton metro area, I would love to help you out. You can give me a call. My phone number is 937-907-6777. Or again, you can book that phone call with the number that works best for you down below. Other than that, thank you for tuning in and I'll talk to you soon.